After staring at tree rows a lot around here, you start to notice that a lot of people just plant willows and poplars, poplars and willows, and other plants that kind of live by the motto of grow fast and die soon. And you start to just really think, I wish I could eat some of those. And fair enough, why not try growing more trees with actual food value? So let's look at a few alternatives. To start off with, one of the more familiar shrubby trees around here, the choke cherry, probably familiar to a lot of my Canadian and American viewers. This tree with the tiny black cherries. If you've never tried these before, you can eat these raw. Some people love them that way. Uh, but eaten raw, they kind of have an acidic, bitter, mouth-drying quality to them. Somehow when I was young, I would just chow down on these things like there was no tomorrow. I don't know how. Maybe that partially explains why I was such a walking barrel of gastric upset at the time. I don't do that anymore, but this is one of my favorite fruits. If you can cook it, sweeten it perhaps, uh, some say adding a bit of baking soda can help, uh, then that bitter flavor kind of reduces and you're left with this complex, dark, mellow, sweet taste. Yeah, still not my first choice for eating straight. Uh, these, uh, the, it kind of makes your mouth feel like it's made of uh, a rough carpet inside, but the, the flavor itself is good and it's weirdly addictive. But yeah, I would still much rather cook these and make something from them than just nibble on them straight. This is a favorite still in some parts today, and historically even more so. This was a very important fruit for a lot of the indigenous groups, and for some groups, even their most important fruit source. This was one of the main fruits used in pemmican, this traditional mixture of meat, fat, and fruit, which the indigenous and some of the early settlers used and traded and even fought some battles over. It was a very efficient and energy-packed way to store food, and it had a lot of vitamins such as vitamin C from the fruit that was used in there, and in the case of choke cherries, also a good th source of stuff like anthocyanins. The fruit's got these big pits in the middle, which you can separate out with a food mill. Uh, apparently some people do pit them individually. I have an indigenous cookbook that tells me to do that, but I don't know how to do that in a way that doesn't go slower than a dugong through molasses. If you have any ideas on that, please let me know in the comments. I'm pretty curious how that works. Like most cherries, the pits here are poisonous, but apparently those toxins will dissipate out if these seeds are crushed and dried. So many indigenous did actually just crush these things whole, pits and all, and just dry the resulting mash for future use. Leaving the pits in there does definitely change the texture, probably not to everyone's liking, but it does add some protein and oil to the mix. But the fruit is great for jams, jellies, juices, sauces, all those sorts of things. Uh, I've never tried it before, but I imagine it would make a pretty good barbecue sauce. Uh, popsicles too. Boy howdy, what I wouldn't do for a choke cherry popsicle right now. One caveat with these. While they are a great tree for growing, great for shelter, great for feeding wildlife as well as humans, they are very susceptible to black knot fungus, which as far as fungi go, it's not winning any beauty pageants. And it will stunt the tree's growth. It is very common here, actually often the easiest way to identify a choke cherry tree in the forests. But it's worth noting, but this is still a great tree. Next, another cherry, the pin cherry. This one named after the fruit looking like pins. Like choke cherries, these ones have big showy blooms early in the year, insect pollinated. They're extraordinarily hardy, found as far north in Canada as the permafrost line, and a little bit south into the border in the northeastern United States. The fruit are very much like a small sour cherry, though I would put the flavor a bit closer to currants. Some people find them a little bit bitter. I've never really had that issue, but uh, yeah, very small, but packed with a lot of flavor. Again, really good for making jams, jellies, juices, anything you would really make with uh, with cherries or currants. One other caveat with this one, or uh, I guess two, it, this one is also susceptible to black knot like the choke cherry. Uh, I keep keep pointing at this, uh, this willow as if it's a pin cherry, but I just couldn't find a pin cherry to film in front of. But apart from the black knot, these are tasty, but not that efficient to harvest. See, they tend to have a lot of fruit, but just the way it's situated all around the tree, it's a lot easier for birds to eat them individually than it is for humans to pick them in bunches. So if you're willing to put in the time, 
these are a good fruit, but I think for me these will always kind of remain just a fun nibble along the trail. One further fact about these, they can be shrubs, but they can also get quite large. Reportedly, in some parts of the Appalachians, even up to 30 meters tall. Generally, though, they're more in a modest 5 to 15 meter range. Very quick growing, though, and very good at handling dry, gravelly, or sandy soil. Depending where you're from, this might be quite familiar, but around here, it's almost entirely unknown, even though it does grow in a few parts of Manitoba. Hackberry. Now, I'll warrant hackberry doesn't sound too promising in the palatability department, but fortunately it's tastier than it sounds. The name hackberry is thought to come from hagberry, which sounds almost as bad, but it's the Scottish name for the bird cherry, another similar looking fruit. Sometimes hackberry gets called sugarberry, and sometimes people argue, no, that name should be reserved only for this other fruit in the same genus, so I don't know, I'm just sticking with hackberry. This can get to be a pretty hefty tree, typically in the 9 to 15 meter range, but under the right conditions, can, it can be up to 40 meters tall and live up to 200 years. It's got really neat bark patterns once it's mature with these really wide and deep grooves running throughout. It's nice looking, makes decent shade, grows well in many different environments, holds up well to the pollution in cities. And of course, there's the fruits, which ripen in autumn and sometimes stay on the tree into the winter. Opinions are a bit divided on this one. There are quite a few other species of hackberry present through a lot of the world, and many of them have historically been quite important and valued food sources. That includes North American ones like this, where some indigenous groups would eat them raw, cook them with meat, mix them with fat, often grinding them up seeds and all. Some have actually hypothesized that the lotus trees in Homer's Odyssey were based on a species of hackberry, which the island's residents were so enamored with that it caused them to forget their previous life and just live in contented lethargy. That's pretty high praise for the fruit. On the other hand, some people find them kind of underwhelming and pretty bland. I think it, it varies a lot from tree to tree and species to species. What I've tried I've liked, but that's a pretty small sample size. And these have pretty hefty seeds. The actual fruit layer is fairly thin. Many people simply crack them with their teeth and eat them with the fruit. But be careful, because the pits can occasionally be very hard in certain trees or cer certain species. These are kind of unusual amongst fruits, and this might be part of their desirability in that they have appreciable amounts of not just sugar, but also proteins and fats that are digestible even without cooking. To use these in food, you'll have to either separate off that flesh, again, probably easiest with a food mill, or you could grind them with the seeds and cook them like that. You could do like the Comanche and a few other tribes and add some a little bit of fat to that mix to make for a richer taste. Again, even if you don't eat these, they are still a great tree to plant in a lot of places, good for a lot of wildlife to provide food, and an interesting tree, and one that really should be more well known around here. But on to the next one. Now, if there's one thing Manitoba could use more of, it's nuts. Not that we don't have our fair share of folk with strange ideas, uh, but uh, here's a butternut. And what a pleasant looking tree. I mean, it's a bit slow growing, but they can get up to 20 meters tall. And this one, it is a drought right now, so this is looking a bit sparse, but in a good year you'll have a nice, full, big round shape. And these are the nuts. They're a type of walnut, sometimes called white walnut. In fall, assuming you can outrun and overpower the squirrels, you will get a pretty hefty crop of these little things. These are pretty tough to crack. The only ways I could find to get them open was with a table vise or with a hammer, so <laughs> hard to open them up intact, but they do have a good flavor. I would say somewhere pretty close to a to a walnut, but with uh, almost like a hint of coconut to it. A good idea not to wear your Sunday best while cracking these things open though. The husk is used to make a pretty strong brown dye. So this is a great tree, probably one of my favorite local ones. But unfortunately, again, this one comes with a big caveat. And that caveat comes with one of the longest scientific names I've ever seen. Well, these used to be more widespread, they're currently endangered and have disappeared from a lot of areas they used to be more common because of a disease wiping through, the butternut canker. 
Once a tree catches this, the branches start to die and the whole tree is usually kaput within a few years. So while well, you can still buy these trees, and they might grow well if, you, if like this you're in an area where there aren't many others to spread the disease, this risk is still there. There is an alternative though. It's thought that disease came over with Japanese walnut trees being imported into North America, but it turns out Japanese walnuts are quite resistant to the disease. So a hybrid has been made between the butternut and the heartnut, a variety of the Japanese, uh, resulting in the buart nut, or wart nut. I'm not sure exactly how you're supposed to say that. I can't think of a good way to do so. But it looks more like the butternut, but has the heart nut's resistance to the canker. Some have further crossbred these buart nuts back with butternuts to create butter buarts. Seriously, buart nuts, butter buarts, those aren't those, those aren't good combinations of mouth sounds. If you have any marketing experience, I think I know someone who could use your services. But anyway, it's not clear if these butter buarts are as resistant to the canker as buart nuts are, but at least that option of buart nuts is still there. But anyway, I, sh I should just move on before I have to say butter buarts anymore. I don't, I don't like pronouncing those sounds with my mouth. For this last one, it may not produce edible fruit, and this is a little further from its native range, but the guy I'm making this video for <laughs> really wanted me to include it. So, it's very common in Western North America, but relatively unknown here in South Central Canada. But, and, well, it's a good tree. The lodgepole pine. This one is a great one for growing in poor soil conditions, and is pretty tolerant of a lot of different types of soil, and at least in some places, it's a nitrogen fixer. As you can guess from the name lodgepole, they're a pretty tall, straight trunk tree, sometimes as tall as 40 meters and as wide as about 2 meters in diameter. And because of that straightness, they were often used by some indigenous groups as poles for making teepees. Today too, they remain pretty popular for making timber, being so hefty, straight, and strong. So why did I include these trees in this list? How can you eat this tree? Well, there's a few ways actually. In my winter foraging video, I talk a bit about eating the inner bark of a spruce, so you can see a little bit more there, but today I'll mention another part, though it's not in season to show, unfortunately, the pollen. Pine trees produce two kinds of cones, male and female. The male puts out pollen, and the female receives it, makes seeds, and then sometimes falls off the tree. When you find pine cones on the ground, that's typically the female you're seeing there. It's a pretty small window of opportunity when the males actually poof out the pollen, but if you catch it at the right time, it can be surprisingly plentiful. And the resulting powder can be used a lot like a nutritious, non-glutinous flour. You can mix it in with wheat flour to turn pretty much any baked goods bright yellow, or just, you know, sprinkle it on, on other things for decoration, or there's a lot of different options there. It is a bit tedious to collect, but if you're willing to take out a loan, you can also buy it online for absurd prices. So the choice is yours. But anyways, lodgepole pines can be a great tree for windrows and shelter belts. And if you've got them already, there's some edible uses as well. And if you're in Manitoba and interested, I'm sure you could call my sponsor. He would be <laughs> more than willing to set you up with them because people tend to buy the trees that they know and almost nobody around here knows lodgepole pines. So, but anyway, that's all I have for this week. As always, if you have any corrections, suggestions, or just want to talk about your favorite local fruit, feel free to comment down below, and liking and subscribing always really helps me out. This video was brought to you by the Stanley Soil Management Association. The SSMA is a non-for-profit organization that offers various ecological goods and services throughout the Pembina Valley Watershed District and beyond. In addition to providing tree sales to landowners, They've planted well over 600 miles of shelter belts since 1987, or somewhere over 700,000 trees. So a big thank you to them for supporting me in doing this, and for more tasty, useful, and otherwise neat plants of Canada and the world. Join me next time on Ambling with Sam.